This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 5, Jesus, the Giver of Rest, ready for teaching on January 29. It's from the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews, authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 22. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It comes to us in so many different translations and in so many different languages. But the language that it speaks is that of love and of the rest that we find in Jesus Christ. And as we open your word this week, we pray your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. May we understand more your love for us. May we share that love with those about us. And today I'd like to pray for people who are having struggles with their health, people who are having struggles with their relationships, and those who are having struggles with their faith. I pray, Lord, that through this lesson, that each of us may be inspired, each of us may find Jesus anew, and that we may follow him more closely. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Let's read that again. Hebrews 4, verse 9. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Hebrews chapter 1 and 2 focuses on the enthronement of Jesus as the ruler and liberator of God's people. Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 introduce Jesus as the one who will provide rest for us. This progression makes sense once we remember that the Davidic covenant promised that God would give the promised king and his people rest from their enemies. Let's read about that in 2 Samuel 7 verses 10 and 11. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. This rest is available to us now that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews describes the rest both as a rest that belongs to God and as a Sabbath rest in Hebrews 4 verses 1 through to 11. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest any one fall according to the same example of disobedience. God made this rest, which was his, available to Adam and Eve. The first Sabbath was the experience of perfection with the one who made that perfection possible. God also promises a Sabbath rest because true Sabbath observance embodies the promise that God will bring that perfection back. 
When we keep the Sabbath, we remember that God made perfection provision for us when he created the world and when he redeemed it at the cross. True Sabbath observance, however, besides first and foremost pointing us back to creation, offers us a foretaste in this imperfect world of the future that God has promised. Sunday, January 23, The Land as a Place of Rest Read Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 to 21. What did God promise Abraham? Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hizzites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites and the Jebusites. When God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt, his purpose was to bring Israel to the land of Canaan, where they would be able to serve and obey him freely. As you read in Exodus chapter 8, verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And Psalm 105, verses 43 to 45, He brought out his people with joy, his chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the lands of the Gentiles, and they inherited the labor of the nations, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. Praise the Lord including enjoying the Sabbath rest that Pharaoh had prohibited in Exodus 5, 5. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. The land of Canaan was the inheritance that God had promised to their father Abraham because he had obeyed God's voice and left his country to go to the promised land, as you read in Genesis eleven thirty one to chapter 12, verse 4. And Terah took his son Abram, and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. God's purpose in giving the land to Israel was not simply for the people to possess it. God was bringing them to himself, as we read in Exodus 19.4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God wanted them to live in a land where they would be able to enjoy an intimate relationship with him without any hindrance, and would be a witness to the world of who the true God was and what he offered his people. Like the Sabbath of creation, the land of Canaan was a framework that made possible an intimate relationship with their Redeemer and the enjoyment of his goodness.' 
In Deuteronomy 12, 1-14, the Lord told the people that they would enter the rest, not simply when they entered the land, but when they had purged the land from idolatry. Let's read that. Deuteronomy 12, 1-14. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess served their gods, on the high mountains, and on the hills, and under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods, and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. But... You shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks, and there... You shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your households, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes, for as yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion nor inheritance with you. Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses, in one of your tribes. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. After that, God would show them, the chosen, a place where he would dwell among them. Read Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11 and Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15. What two things does the Sabbath rest commemorate and how are they related? First of all, Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and and hallowed it. And Deuteronomy 5, beginning at verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. God connected the Sabbath of creation with the deliverance from Egypt. He instructed Israel to observe the Sabbath as a memorial of creation and as a memorial of their redemption from Egypt. Creation and redemption were both enshrined in the Sabbath commandment. Just as we did not create ourselves, we cannot redeem ourselves. It's a work that only God can do. And by resting, we acknowledge our dependence upon him, not only for existence, but also for salvation. Sabbath-keeping is a powerful expression of salvation by faith alone. And so to finish today, 
How should keeping the Sabbath help us understand our complete dependence upon God, not only for existence, but also for salvation? Monday, January 24, because of unbelief. Read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. Why was Israel unable to enter into the promised rest? Hebrews 3, beginning at verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. The sad story is that those who were delivered from Egypt were unable to enter into the rest that God had promised them. When the Israelites arrived at Kadesh Barnea, at the point of the promised land, they lacked the faith that they needed. Numbers 13 and Numbers 14 explain that the Israelite spies brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land in Numbers 13.32. They affirmed that the land was good, but they warned that the inhabitants were strong and the cities were fortified and that they would not be able to conquer it. Joshua and Caleb agreed that the land was good and did not dispute the fact that the people there were strong and the cities were fortified, but they said that God was with them and that he would bring them into the land in Numbers 14 verses 7 to 9. And that reads, And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear for the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Yet the people who saw God destroy Egypt through plagues in Exodus chapter 7 through to chapter 12, annihilate Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea in Exodus 14, and provide bread from heaven in Exodus 16, and water from the rock in Exodus 17, as well as manifest his continuing presence and guidance through the cloud in Exodus 40, verses 36 to 38, fail to trust in him now. Exodus 40, verses 36 to 38. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. It is a tragic irony that the generation who saw such mighty displays of God's power became a symbol of faithlessness, as we read in Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 15 to 17. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst, and told them to go in to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. 
They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. And then in Psalm 106 verse 24 to 26, then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents and did not heed the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he raised his hand in an oath against them to overthrow them in the wilderness. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 5 to 10, but with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, now these things became an example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in the one day twenty-three thousand fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. God promises his children gifts that are beyond human reach. That is why they are based on grace and are accessible only through faith. Hebrews 4.2 explains that the promise Israel received was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Israel travelled to the borders of the promised land as a people. When the people were faced with contradictory reports, they identified with those who lacked faith. Faith, or lack of it, is contagious. That is why Hebrews admonishes its readers to exhort one another in Hebrews 3.13, to stir up one another to love and good works in chapter 10 verse 24, and to see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God in Hebrews 12 verse 15. And so to finish today, in what ways can you help build the faith of fellow believers? How can you make sure that you never say or do anything that could weaken another's faith? Tuesday, January 25. Today, if you hear his voice. Read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 to 8. What is the meaning of entering rest today in connection with keeping the Sabbath? Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains that some must enter in, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day." The unbelief of the desert generation prevented them from entering into the rest God promised. But God kept urging his people to enter this rest and not to harden their hearts. Paul repeats several times that God's promise remains in verse 1 and verse 6, since therefore it remains, and verse 9... There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. He uses the Greek verbs katalipo and apolipo, emphasising that the promise of entering his, that's God's, rest still stands in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. The fact that the invitation to enter the rest was repeated in the time of David in verses 6 and 7, uh, referring to Psalm 95, implied both that the promise had not been claimed and that it was still 
available. Verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 4, Since therefore it remains that some must enter in, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In fact, Paul suggests that the experience of true Sabbath rest has been available since the time of creation, as we read in verses 3 and 4. God invites us today to enter into his rest. Today is a crucial concept throughout Scripture. When Moses renewed Israel's covenant with God at the border of the Promised Land, he emphasised the importance of today. And we read that in Deuteronomy 5, verse 3, The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. And we'll compare that with Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 8. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? And Deuteronomy 6 verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And there are lots of others we could find in the scriptures. It was a moment of reflection to recognize God's faithfulness. As we read in Deuteronomy 11 verses 2 to 7. Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his signs and his acts which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh king of Egypt and to all his land, what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and their chariots, how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. What he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, their households, their tents, and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord, which he did. And a time of decision to obey the Lord, Deuteronomy 5, verses 1 to 3. And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Lord, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. Similarly, Joshua called on the people of his time to choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, Joshua 24 verse 15. In the same way, today is a time of decision for us, a time of opportunity as well as danger, as it has always been for God's people, as we read in 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today appears five times in Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4. It emphasizes the importance of listening to God's voice. As we read in Hebrews 3 verse 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice. And verse 15, While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And Hebrews chapter 4 verse 7, Again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden harden your hearts, because failing to listen and believe God's word leads to disobedience and the hardening of our hearts. It could even delay our entrance into the heavenly Canaan, just as it kept the wilderness generation from entering the earthly Canaan. But Jesus has defeated our enemies, as we read in Hebrews 2, 14-16, and inaugurated a new covenant in Hebrews chapters 8, 9 and 10. Let's read Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 16. 
Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham." Thus we can come boldly to the throne of grace, as we read in Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The appeal today invites us to recognise that God has been faithful to us and has provided us with every reason to accept his invitation right away, without delay. And so to finish today... What spiritual decisions must you make today, that is, not put off for another time? What have been your past experiences when you have delayed doing what you knew God would have you do right away? Wednesday, January 26. Entering into His Rest. Read Hebrews chapter 3, verse 11, and Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1, 3, 5, and 10. How does God characterize the rest He invites us to enter? Hebrews 3, verse 11. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And Hebrews 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. And verse 3, For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And verse 5, And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. And verse 10, For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Both the Sabbath commandment in Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11 and Moses' restatement of it in Deuteronomy 5 12 to 15 invite us to remember what God has done for us. As we have seen, what God wrote on tablets of stone point us to the finishing of his work of creation. In Exodus 31, verse 18, we read, And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. And Exodus 34, verse 28, So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. In Deuteronomy, Israel is commanded to keep the Sabbath in view of God's finished work of deliverance from Egyptian bondage. The exodus from Egypt pointed forward to the ultimate work of deliverance from sin that Christ would accomplish on the cross when he said, It is finished in John 19.30. So, the Sabbath is doubly blessed and, in fact, is especially meaningful for Christians. Read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 to 11 and verse 16. What are we called to do? Hebrews 4, beginning at verse 9. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest any one fall according to the same example of disobedience. And then verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
The Sabbath rest celebrates the fact that God ended or finished his work of creation, as we read in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Let's read that. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it." Or redemption, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 to 15. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of the cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Similarly, Jesus' enthronement in the heavenly temple celebrates that he finished offering a perfect sacrifice for our salvation. Hebrews 10, 12-14 But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Notice that God rests only when he has secured our well-being. At creation, God rested when he had finished the creation of the world. Later on, God rested in the temple only after the conquest of the land he had promised Abraham was completed through the victories of David. And Israel lived in safety, as we read in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 21 to 25. So Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Now Solomon's provision for one day was thirty cores of fine flour, sixty cores of meal, ten fatted oxen, twenty oxen from the pastures, and one hundred sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fatted fowl. For he he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river from Tifsa even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace on every side all around him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. And we'll compare that with Exodus 15, verses 18 to 21. The Lord shall reign for ever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. And Deuteronomy 11.24, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours, from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea shall be your territory. 
And Second Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 14, After this it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Methog Amma from the hand of the Philistines. Then he defeated Moab, forcing them down to the ground. He measured them off with a line. With two lines he measured off those to be put to death, and with one full line those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadazedda, the son of Rehob, the king of Zobah, and he went to recover his territory at the river Euphrates. David took with him 1,000 chariots, 700 horsemen, and 20,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. So the Lord preserved David wherever he went, and David took the shields of gold that had belonged to the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Beta and from Berathai, city of Hadadezer, King David took a large amount of bronze. When Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the armies of Hadadezer, then Toi sent Joram his son to King David to greet him and bless him, because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him, for Hadadezer had been at war with Toi, and Joram brought with him articles of silver, articles of gold, and articles of bronze. King David also dedicated these to the Lord, along with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued, from Syria, from Moab, from the people of Ammon, from the Philistines, from Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David made himself a name when he returned from killing 18,000 Syrians in the Valley of Salt. He also put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David wherever he went. God had a house built for himself only after Israel and the king had houses for themselves. And so to finish the day, how can we enter into his rest even now? That is, how can we, by faith, rest in the assurance of the salvation that we have in Christ and not in ourselves? Thursday, January 27, a foretaste of new creation. Compare Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15, and Hebrews 4, verses 8 to 11. What differences do you find regarding the meaning of the Sabbath rest? First of all, Exodus 20, beginning at verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. And Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant 
it may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. And Hebrews 4 verses 8 to 11. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest any one fall according to the same example of disobedience. As we already have seen, these texts in Exodus and Deuteronomy invite us to look at the past. They exhort us to rest on Sabbath in order to celebrate God's accomplishments of creation and redemption. Hebrews 4, 9-11, which we've just read, however, invites us to look to the future. It tells us that God has prepared a Sabbath rest that is in the future. It suggests a new dimension for Sabbath-keeping. Sabbath rest not only memorialises God's victories in the past, but also celebrates God's promises for the future. The future dimension of Sabbath observance has always been there, but it has often been neglected. After the fall, it came to imply the promise that God would one day restore creation to its original glory through the Messiah. God commanded us to celebrate His acts of redemption through Sabbath observance because Sabbath pointed forward to the culmination of redemption in a new creation. Sabbath observance is an anticipation of heaven in this imperfect world. This has always been clear in Jewish tradition. Life of Adam and Eve in James H. Charlesworth's edition of the Old Testament Pseudoepigrapha, Volume 2, published in 1984 and on page 18, a work composed between 100 BC and 200 AD, said, The seventh day is a sign of the resurrection, the rest of the coming age. Another ancient Jewish source said, The coming age is the day which is holy Sabbath rest for eternity by Jacob Nusser in The Mishnah, A New Translation, published in 1988, page 873. And the author of Rabbi Akaba, a later source, said, Israel said before the Holy One, blessed be he, Master of the world, if we observe the commandments, what reward will we have? He said to them, The world to come. They said to him, Show us its likeness. He showed them the Sabbath. And that's by Theodore Friedman, The Sabbath Anticipation of Redemption, Judaism, a quarterly journal, volume 16, pages 443 and 444. Sabbath is for celebration, for joy and thanksgiving. When we keep the Sabbath, we indicate that we believe God's promises, that we accept His gift of grace. Sabbath is faith alive and vibrant. As far as actions go, Sabbath observance is probably the fullest expression of our conviction that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And so to finish the day. How can we learn to keep the Sabbath in a way that indeed shows our understanding of what salvation by faith, apart from the deeds of the law, is about? How is resting on the Sabbath an expression of salvation by grace? Friday, January 28. It is very significant that Paul in Hebrews used the Sabbath rest and not Sunday as a symbol of the salvation through grace that God offers us. The use of Sabbath rest in this way implies that Sabbath was cherished and observed by believers. 
From the 2nd century AD forward, however, we find evidences of a decisive change in the church. Sabbath observance ceased to be considered a symbol of salvation and was instead considered a symbol of allegiance to Judaism and the Old Covenant, one that had to be avoided. To keep the Sabbath became the equivalent of to Judaize. For example, Ignatius of Antioch, around AD 110, remarked, Those who lived according to the old order have found the new hope. They no longer observe the Sabbath, but the day of the Lord, the day our life was resurrected with Christ. And that's by Jacques B. Docum, Israel and the Church, Two Voices for the Same God, published in 2002, page 42. Similarly, Marcion ordered his followers to fast on Sabbath as a sign of rejection of the Jews and their God, and Victorianus did not want it to appear that he observed the Sabbath of the Jews, as in the book Israel and the Church we referenced yesterday, page 41 to 45. It was the loss of understanding of Sabbath observance as a symbol of salvation by grace that led to its demise in the Christian Church. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 288 and 289, The Sabbath is a sign of God's power to make us holy, and it is given to all whom Christ makes holy. As a sign of his sanctifying power, the Sabbath is given to all who through Christ become a part of the Israel of God. The Sabbath points them to the works of creation as an evidence of his mighty power in redemption. While it calls to mind the lost peace of Eden, it tells of peace restored through the Saviour, and every object in nature repeats his invitation, Come unto me, all ye who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11:28. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. What is the relationship between Sabbath observance and justification by faith? And 2. What is the difference between true observance of the Sabbath and a legalistic observance of the Sabbath? How can we not only know the difference, but also experience that difference in our own Sabbath observance? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Finding Peace and it's by Andrew McChesney. It was the worst day of Yen's life. The witch doctor approached him in their village in southern Laos and announced that he was going to die. And there is no one who can help you, the witch doctor said solemnly. Yen was scared. People in his village believed that the witch doctor always spoke the truth. He could not lie. Yen did not want to die. He was so frightened that he could not eat or sleep. Soon his wife noticed that something was terribly wrong. What happened? she asked. Yen told her about his encounter with the witch doctor. I am going to die, he said. He didn't know what to do. His wife didn't know what to do. Then he heard about a small group of Christians who gathered on Saturdays to worship. He had never been inside a Christian church, but he decided to find out whether the Christians would ask their God to help him. Next Sabbath, Yin and his wife showed up at the Seventh-day Adventist church. He told the church members about the witch doctor and his fear of dying. After listening, the members told him about Jesus. They said Jesus had the power not only to save him from the witch doctor's prediction of death, but also to offer him eternal life. In their Bibles was the promise, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Yin was overjoyed when he heard about Jesus. He could claim the peace that only Jesus offers. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 14, 27 
When he left the church, he was so happy that he could not keep the good news to himself. He eagerly shared the peace that Jesus had given him with other villagers. He walked home with a big smile on his face. It was the best day of his life. Today, Yin is alive and well, and he is attending the church where he first found Jesus. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that help spread the gospel to people in Laos and other countries of the Southern Asia Pacific Division, which will receive this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering. This mission story illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan, to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach among unreached and underreached people groups and to non-Christian religions. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.